How does nature do the math? Quantum probability theory offers answers in terms of event algebras and projections. John Harland has a passion for physics, a PhD in functional analysis, and a desire to explain to me and to you how this works uh, as part of his quest to find a satisfying foundation for quantum physics. He's visiting me in Lithuania now, and we're getting to work together on relating uh, wondrous wisdom with uh, his uh, understanding of quantum physics. Will this satisfy you? I am Andrus Kolikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. So last time we were talking about just straight, straight up probability theory and how it relates to classical mechanics and showing that um, predictions are unlike what you see in quantum mechanics where you see um, in the, for example, the double slit experiment, you see interference fringes and quantum and uh, quantum measurements and um it's it's very hard to understand how that could result from a classical model as we talked about last time and regarding regarding um you know what it what it is about quantum measurement that is um rather unique is that you know the different possibilities for the double slit appear to be combining like waves not not as collections of particles and the the other maybe even more significant is that if you do a measurement and you do subsequent measurements you get the stability in quantum mechanics that if you measure a system and it produces a particular state if you produce the same measurement you'll still be in that state so if you measure a particle and spin up and as you devise an apparatus to measure a spin up particle and then you measure its spin thereafter and you haven't perturbed it or subjected it to any external influence it will still be spin up if you measure a particle at a position subsequent measurements will reveal it at that particular position unless you allow it to evolve or you perturb it or you 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 do something to it so um so there is this sort of stability in quantum mechanics it's rather contrary to the probabilistic interpretation of quantum mechanics so when you measure a a, a, a system in a state a particular state and you go to remeasure it in that state it's remains in that state until further disturbance so and this uh um, yeah yeah this is uh inspiring me to uh think and so the thought that i have that i want to share is that uh, in math um in linear algebra we have this distinction between basis free uh approach versus particularly picking, choosing, selecting a particular basis. So when you select a particular basis, you have the advantages that you get to do calculations uh, uh, very definitively, you know, on a on a element basis, coordinate basis. You can talk about axes and things. You can write things out. But um, there's um, often we're taught uh, in abstract mathematics that that's wrong. You know, that we shouldn't be doing that. We should be using abstract arguments. Uh, and just you know, talking about homomorphisms and just looking at things in a very general way without descending to the specificity. But this inspiration number two that you have, uh, to me, really speaks to that distinction. It's almost uh, like or it's suggestive of this idea that, oh, when you do a measurement, you've introduced a basis. So uh, and once you've introduced a basis, you're working within that basis. So, you know, you're once you've started calculating with a particular basis, your you know, your numbers make sense, so to speak. But until you have a basis before you have the measurement done, you're kind of working in this free world where it's not really clear what the numbers mean. You know, like there are no numbers. They're just these uh, things that come before the numbers, these stru structures. And so uh, 
later on, depending on how you look at uh, the basis you choose, you're going to get a particular set of numbers, a particular cross section or part of the way of looking at it that'll make it very concrete. So if you don't know what's going on ahead of time, it would look probabilistic, like, well, why those numbers? <laughs> and then the idea would be that, well, because that was the basis that had to get chosen. But so nature prefers to work without a basis. But if you force it, then under certain conditions, you know, where you're basically the conditions that you're introducing observer, you're doing a measurement or whatever those conditions are, happen to be the conditions where nature is forced to choose a basis. That's what I'm thinking. It, it is, you know, it is not unlike um, relativity theory where you, you know, you have, you know, the, the concept of relativistic invariance where you should be able to translate your physics into any reference frame and you should get the same physics. Now, what does it mean but to have the same physics? I mean, it, you know, um, Galileo had his own, uh, or Newton had their own idea about what that should mean. Einstein expanded that idea uh, at least twice. And so, and so the and, difference and, between what I'm saying is to say like in all those cases, like you said, it's invariant. You have one basis, and then you go to another basis, and there's rules of how you do that. What I'm saying, that's not what this is about. This is saying that nature is able to function without a basis, without a coordinate system in the quantum mechanical world. You know, But then when you do a measurement, that is when the basis appears. Yeah, I, th I think we're going to find that out. And so... I mean, there is this weird dichotomy, and, and I think that since you're a philosopher, you probably understand it better than I do, between what nature is and how you interact with it. And it seems to me like whenever you build a machine, um, you know, in the laboratory, uh, physics is very much based on, you know, you know, laboratory experiments, you're interacting with nature in a very specific way, and with a in a sense, you're laying down a coordinate system. You're laying down a basis. Is, of course, the way Einstein thought about it. And but there's something. There's some kind of dualism, a dualism going on there that may be pulling the rug over our eyes. In other words, we have to. You know, I think even even in this discussion, we're going to see that there's kind of some subtleties. You know, that are often brushed under the rug. Um, so yeah. I'll let you I'll let you proceed, but um, especially because like for Math for Wisdom, uh, you'll be coming to Lithuania. Well, we'll be talking, I think, a lot about two by two matrices and how they are basically making structure more evident, splitting things in half. And then you can go deeper and deeper and deeper. And one of your themes is this uh, agency hierarchy, you know, that how is it that... Uh, you can have more and more of a sense that somebody is causing something. And so I think what this relates to is that by the time you're a scientist doing an experiment, there's so many layers of agency there that you're actually forcing nature into some kind of coordinate system where the basis doesn't really have much choice what it's going to be, so to speak. Well, it's just going to be deaf something becomes definite basically at a certain point. So where it didn't have to be defined at all uh, for the longest time, uh, you know, it was waiting. When When is it going to have to be defined? It's preferring not kind of like also like the, the sloshing of energy between kinetic form and potential, as you see with uh, Lagrangian, you know, minimizing Lagrangian is basically, I think, meaning that you don't want to be converting potential energy to kinetic energy more than you absolutely have to. So the same with this type of agency, like you're avoiding being concrete about this coordinate system until you have to, you know, until nature gives in. So that's, I mean, we, but this is all getting up to what you're going to tell us. It would, wouldn't it be nice having a, having more clarity about this whole, this whole business between nature and, you know, how we can act on it, how we can interact with it. Uh, what is the division between the observer and the observed and, and all that kind of stuff. And it, it's, it, you know, it, quantum mechanics makes an attempt. It has to, it has to, you know, clarify that to some extent. Um, one, one, one theme I, but, I do want to add, it does, it, but it, just, it does not clarify it in an ultimate sense. And I think that that is part of what's missing at the foundation of quantum mechanics. That that would be my intuition. Um, and and one, one theme that I want to add that comes up in Math for Wisdom with uh, 
uh, Jerry Northrup, uh, he as an ecotechnologist has a PhD in uh, molecular biology slash biophysics, but he keeps saying like nature doesn't do the math, you know, like the way that we do math. Well, um, I think what he means is like nature doesn't do calculations, so to speak, or nature doesn't maybe even uh, apply formulas, so to speak. But the question is, what does it mean for nature to be doing math? And uh, again, like in this layers of agency hierarchy, you know, like it nature ends up at a certain point where it is doing something like a calculation or a specification or something. I don't know. So we're we're well, we we're building into this. We certainly <laughs> we certainly set up nature to do math. I mean, what's that's what a digital computer is. I mean, we we. Mm -hmm. um, and and then a quantum computer does a math at a sort of a different level. Mm. Uh, we certainly do that. We certainly set up these Rube Goldberg machines to do our math for us. And um, you know, and that was conceived uh well a very long time ago with you know, people used to use rocks, you know, and the and the, and the fact mm -hmm. that rocks have a particular position when you when you move a sure. rock into a particular position, it stays there using laws of nature. Uh, to your advantage, you know, when you're doing accounting by means of rocks, um, and then later uh, mechanical, um, you know, mechanical calculators, and then and then more recently digital calculators. Of course, we're using nature to do our calculations. Now, the question is, is that it's sort of a dumbed down level compared to what nature does in just normal, uh, you know, day to day, you know activities of daily living for physics you know like it, as it gets through it's it's well well, well and, he's a and, he's a biologist so what he's saying like when a plant grows right like the plant is not calculating let's say the plant is not you know like what's going on there right but i think first of all uh actually you know the way if you look at what proteins are doing proteins are very much like rube goldberg machines it's just amazing how mechanical they are Oh yeah, you know, that's that's stunning. Like to see that there's actually machinery. You know, it's really all basically most a lot of it's machinery. A little bit maybe of electricity going on, um, maybe some chemical flows, but a lot of machinery. Um, but so the question is like, how? In what sense? What's the mathematics behind that? Or I think of Stephen Wolfram. You know, he's trying to say, look, there's a lot of cellular automata stuff going on on different levels. So he would, but you know, you look at uh, gauge theory. Like what's how is nature doing math with gauge theory? You know, is it, you know, what is it, you know, that's our math, but like what's actually happening, you know, with gravity, right? Like, you know, Einstein's field equations. These are just themes that are in the air. So I just wanted to. Yeah, I don't out. know. I, and I just don't think we have either a philosophical or, or foundational um, platform yet to fully understand this it looks you know it's sort of like looking back in a mirror like who is me and who is in the mirror you know like we're not quite clear on that yet and you know you and i are uh vigorously <laughs> working on this kind of stuff and and we hope we make some kind of progress but you know i i, I do have i do have confidence that this will be understood at a much deeper and better level in the future at some point you know i mean I, that's kind of what i my my at least my when i hope for the future i hope for world peace but i also hope for this you know intellectual uh you know this kind of intellectual progress that would allow us to under you know feel you know um dissect this in a better way right now it's all so freaking conflated um you know there is a book by seth lloyd called the computing universe where he argues that the universe as it is is indistinguishable from a quantum computer Mm. so he believes that a general quantum computer if you look at the state of a general quantum computer and you set it up the right way it would be indistinguishable from what we see in the universe so it is a computing machine he's and, and maybe to say like what the qubit does uh which is related to su2 um which is related to the two by two matrices <laughs> but uh it's saying that instead of having a digital logic where it's like you know plus and I mean, plus and minus, you know, ones and zeros and such. It's saying that, no, it's more like rotating a sphere where there's this continuity, you know, or like having any possible position on a sphere, let's say, where there's this. So then that's not as, um, 
well, digital, so to speak, as the way we're used to thinking of a lot of, you know, computing, let's say. It's a very different flavor of computing. Um, Yeah, and well, if, you know, and that the fact that you know, a state with respect to one basis and a superposition with respect to another basis, um, mm -hmm. this, this is key in 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 qubit theory, um, and so that allows for this massive parallelism that you get in quantum computers, quote unquote parallelism, mm -hmm. quantum parallelism. Um, And so that's another change. Like instead of thinking is everything happening sequentially, that there's things happening massively in parallel across all of nature, you know, every electron or every everything is participating maybe. So, you know, in a sense, this kind of um, calling idea that I've been mm -hmm. talking about is, a, you know, it, it is an attempt to peel back a layer um, of the computing machinery and saying that there's something else going on uh, in addition to just this computation of the laws of physics following this kind of Rube Goldberg thing that the The machine is actually deeper than that, and um, and when you when you come and we'll be talking uh, about two by two matrices, both from the physical point, like you know CPT symmetry, the dynamics that you're having, and also from the bot periodicity, I'm interesting, like mental perspectives. But the way that they divide up uh, symmetric spaces in half, you know, so to speak, um, suggests that. Um, well, where's the other half go? And like, there is this culling in there. Like, you know, you have an operator, you a, a linear complex operator, you impose it. Uh, so half of the stuff works very well. It commutes with it, but the other half of the stuff doesn't commute. And so kind of like gets culled away. I could, that, that, that actually sounds like a very interesting model for calling because I have no model for it. I have no, I, I, I just am proposing that it exists, but I have no, I have no model other than the fact that something is inconsistent and then that just gets taken out of the history. You know, it's like, uh, bye-bye, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, I'll, <laughs> please continue. We're, we're kind of going pretty far <laughs> afield here. I had an idea, so I thought we should. Yeah. Since we're, since we're going so far afield, I, I just want to point out one other thing like that I think is really tantalizing about thermodynamics first of all oh, okay. i feel like the only agency we have is really over therm thermodynamic processes i think that if we if you say that a human has agency it's really the only agency i think we have or it seems to be or maybe it's just a category of agency but i'm, I'm going to propose right now i'm just going to i'm just going to uh lay it down that the only thing we can do is to say yes no to a thermodynamic process to either open a valve or close a valve and then mm -hmm. the rest is just sort of you know letting you know nature springs like you know uh like like fall into position you know it's sort of like we have little blocks in our root goldberg machine we go and we remove them we remove these constraints and that's how we control nature that's how we uh, navigate through the world now well in, in i mean in Mm -hmm. so so the thing about the thing about this is the very interesting about thermodynamic uh, machines is that under adiabatic processes that is processes where you do not exchange energy with the thermodynamic mm -hmm. uh it, you know thermodynamic subject if you're the agent and there's a thermodynamic subject in other words a, a subsystem of your and you don't exchange any heat energy with it um one formulation of the second law of thermodynamics is Kara Theodori's that's uh, kind of an approximation of the um the name you know the famous mathematician Kara Theodori yeah I've heard of uh-huh and and uh he uh proposed a very abstract version of the second law of thermodynamics it's really tantalizing I think it you know would be really appealing to you and me in that under adiabatic processes there are there are nearby points in the phase space that are inaccessible in other words you cannot get to every point in the phase space now what that what that if you if you apply that 
machinery of differential geometry to that statement, what you get is that there's these adiabatic surfaces that are constant entropy surfaces. And so if you're on an adiabatic surface, of course, you're in a, in a, in a high co-dimensional, uh, you know, basically a low dimensional surface that you can, you can navigate through, uh, but you cannot go off that surface. So there are nearby points, you know, points within a neighborhood of each point that are inaccessible. So that's, that's basically, uh, Kara Theodori showed that that's equivalent to the, or it's, or it's very, you can derive the second law of thermodynamics from it. Mm. That this is another way of stating that. And another way so of stating it's another way of stating the existence of an entropy function in, in constant entropy surfaces. And and um no, no, I'm sorry. It's not the second law of thermodynamics. It's it's the it's the constant it's the existence of an entropy function. Um mm -hmm. so and I, I just so the, wanted to uh, maybe give my understanding that thermodynamics is uh, relevant here because um, it has an arrow of time. Uh, it's not the case, um, you know, with much of physics, let's say, like with gravity, like where you can go forward and you can unwind the reel and go backwards. And so basically everything is sitting as if it was in the same time, you know, that there's... So there's this notion of time that actually uh, proceeds and um, it's consequential. And then this yes or no, again, reminds me of those two by two matrices where you can, or maybe like the qubit, like where you can to set up which way you want to frame that question. So not only do you get to, uh, you know, maybe that's the, where the freedom is, uh, is that you get to, uh, even as maybe you're walking along that entropy surface, so to speak, you get to glide along it where you want and then you get to... Uh, decide which way to face and which way to set up your valves. Yeah. Um, so, you know, by analogy, the question is, what initial states can we prepare in a mechanical system? Um, mm -hmm. now, our, now, our mechanical systems in, in classical physics are really thermodynamic. They're really assemblages of large numbers of things, right? Um, and we can pull springs and we can, you know, like make machines and, you know, macroscopic machines, but really we're working with thermodynamic entities. And, but the thing is when we get right down to the basic physics where we're dealing with a single particle, are there constraints on initial states? And then the, the other question is like, why the hell is there repeatability? Like, why do we have the ability to even perform experiments like what is it about nature that allows that kind of quasi periodicity where we get back to the same initial state and do it again and do it again and do it again now, i mean all of our experimental science is based on that ability mm -hmm. to create this kind of quasi periodic environment for our for our experiments and do we have full control over the initial state um so it's kind of like I mean, do we really have that kind of agency? In a sense, thermodynamics is telling us that we do not have full agency over thermodynamic processes mm -hmm. unless we interact with them in a non-adiabatic way. In other words, we have to open the system up. We have to we have to we have to enlarge the system so that we can, well, put energy in or you know. Well, something. we can't observe them from afar without uh, interacting with them, so to speak. We have to interact with them, or well, we have to. Well, if you want to control something, them. like uh, if you want to, if you want to control something, like run a heat engine, you have to. It it has to be a close. It has. It cannot be a closed system. Um, and so, likewise, but it can be closed for a while, right? Like it, I think that's the point, right? Like you can have a temporary subsystem. Maybe I think that's the whole point of physics is to well, isolate you, something. Yeah, certainly when a, a piston is expanding after the gas has exploded, then yes, it's adiabatic. You're you're just following a, we're following a, uh, uh, a well-defined adiabatic path on the thermodynamic surface, low-dimensional thermodynamic surface. But mm -hmm. you know you do have to put that gas in and explode it. You know, so you have to reach in at some point and. Uh, because if you just stay on that adiabatic surface, you're not going to be able to extract energy over a cycle. So, um, 
So likewise with, with, you know, I'm wondering like in a particular mechanical system, how much control do you have? Like if we are really just quantum mechanical, if everything can be explained quantum mechanically, can we really manipulate ourselves back into the initial state? without enlarging the system somehow. I'm trying to argue that mm -hmm. that quantum mechanical states are just a subset of the larger states that we see in the universe, right? You know, that breakdown, that, that two by two breakdown, mm -hmm. where the lower right hand corner represents, represents the quantum mechanical states, you know, and I've got a mathematical representation of that. And it's a subset of the overall phase space, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the, um, you know, the functions over phase space. And the question is, if you stay within a certain mechanical system, stay within a certain physical system, can you, do you have sufficient agency to keep on repeating experiments or do you have to enlarge that system? And so it's kind of harkens back to this idea of thermodynamics. Like you don't really have full control. You can't really use thermodynamic systems to your advantage and get back to cycles where you extract, you extract energy without enlarging the system. Well, and I think for me, it sounds like uh, you're pointing to the rule of time. So like if I was imagining this, uh, I can set up uh, a system, so to speak, isolate it, uh, and then let it go. Let's see, say, what's nature going to do? But time is flowing. And then after a certain amount of time, it can come back and check, like, well, you know, what happened to my toast? It got burnt, let's say, right? But but there's a certain sense in which that system maybe was isolatable, you know, for some time, or at least maybe, you know, approximately. But I come back. But time was moving, first of all. So if you think of phase space as including time, right? Like, well, <laughs> there's that whole issue. So we're kind of assuming that, well, we're allowing ourselves to take the time out you know, and kind of like, um, and maybe like to restrict ourselves to the flow of time to say, well, you know, time is going to be flowing, but can we keep everything else, you know, isolated, let's say, yeah, because uh, we can't stop time from flowing and we can't get back to where time was, let's say. So, um, so that points to a special notion of time, but in a certain sense, it suggests that, uh, yes, we can conduct experiments, I think, you know, like, yeah. Right. And allow nature to do its thing uh, in a subsystem that there can be isolated subsystems. That's, I think, the whole point of physics. Yes. And that's a, it's a very special thing about the universe, isn't it? So M acts like a projection. In other words, M squared is equal to M. Mm -hmm. So let's make all this concrete. So, so in quantum mechanics, um, the probability setup, it turns out there is going to be no difference between the probability setup in quantum mechanics and the probability setup in just standard probability theory. Um, and this is a misconception that there is a difference in, in some of the literature that I've read, you know, that, oh, this is a new kind of probability theory. Um, in a book by Robert Griffiths called Consistent Quantum Theory, I learned that that is not really the deal. That's not really what's going on. That's not really what's novel about quantum mechanics. That's different than classical quantum, than the classical theory. So in classical theory, you know, we talked about points and space and, you know, the events are collections of points in space. So in quantum mechanics, the points in space that we're going to talk about are, are subspaces of a larger space. Basically, instead of thinking about our basic outcomes as a point in a space, it's going to be a different kind of mathematical object, but it's still just a mathematical object. And so quantum events okay so you start with a hilbert space and it could be finite dimensional or infinite dimensional so 
we'll call this the um, configuration space. It's often just L2 instead of square integral functions over inappropriate are um, just whatever. But it also could be, or, you know, L2 complex valued, and these are complex valued functions, but they're over a real space, maybe R3 cross, uh, uh, you know, maybe C2 for, for, uh, uh, for spinners or whatever. So depending on the quantum system that you're trying to model, you know, you may choose a different configuration space, but you have a configuration space and this is a Hilbert space. It's a closed, complete vector space. Often infinite dimensional, but it doesn't have to be. <clears throat> so, um, and so already there's a little bit of a difference here. Instead of talking about points in an actual physical space, you're talking about functions on that physical space. So maybe that is a little bit of a, a bit of a generalization. And I think that really, I think that's the only generalization that's going on here. Now, the outcomes. Are closed subspaces. And I'm going to write that um, kind of in this less than note notation. Uh, so closed subspaces. And um, just very, you know, each closed subspaces, this closed subspace, E is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the orthogonal projection onto that subspace. I'm going to write that as P, e, P sub E. And what is P sub E? P sub E, you can write out in terms of a basis. You don't necessarily have to, but P sub E on a on a vector, now I have to be very careful. Let's call that. So if for any vector in the Hilbert space, what does this projection look like? It looks like this. Where EI is an orthogonal basis, orthonormal basis, I should say. And the EI corresponds to the capital E, so to speak. Right, that's right. So you know this, uh, are you, this formula familiar? Is that, is that okay? It's just a... Uh, I'm hanging with you, but maybe could you go back to the start? Just, I want to compare the configuration space with the uh, outcome space, right? So... You're saying that uh, H is a Hilbert space. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yes. But you're saying that uh, L2 space can be a Hilbert space. And so what that means is L2 is all these functions, you know, that they're, let's say, square integrable, but there's a whole yeah. bunch of functions. You would pick up, you could pick a basis. It would be mm -hmm. an infinite basis. It could be uncountably. It would be uncountably infinite, I guess, right? Like, so, um, but that oh, would no, be a... I mean, no, no, these are separate. Uh, often, often you're basis in your Hilbert spaces in standard quantum mechanics are often separable. And I think in, in quantum field theory, it can be so not countable. There's like a countable basis, like, you know, yeah. e to the next negative x squared over two times polynomials, that type of thing. Is that like, yeah, yeah. Like, like Hermite, Hermite polynomials would be a, a, a 
account. Hermite functions, yeah. right? Like, yeah. So like L2 of R is Hermite polynomials are one basis. There's lots of, lots well, of basis. not. I mean, but you would have to multiply them by something to damp them, right? Like, so Absolutely. either the next yeah, The Hermite part. polynomials are all, are all squared integral because they have an e to the minus x squared thing in them. Yeah. Those aren't polynomials. Those are the functions, right? The oh, I'm sorry. Hermite functions. I meant Just, Hermite functions. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. But at least I understand. Okay. So you have this H is a Hermite. I mean, H is a um, Hilbert space. Yeah. And then, but it's, these are like functions. Now, when you say um, the outcomes are also in the Hilbert space, right? And well, so they're, these are close they're subspaces. They're subspaces. Yeah. They're not elements. They're subspaces of, uh, they okay. Yes. And the subspaces being closed, uh, they can be defined by uh in the this you're summing over i that could be possibly infinite uh, set of um oh absolutely yeah i mean when i when i sum over i um it's a, a finite or infinite set or um like uh yeah okay and we're talking about separable case but you can you can expand this to an inseparable non-separable case in which case you're not going to be able to just sum over you know do a do a simple discrete sum like this but that separable basically means like you can have this countable basis is that or that's what right is countable basis countable basis yes okay so i'm hanging with you and then i'll keep dragging you slowly. yeah that's okay that's okay oh. i mean there's a lot of, there's a lot of details here and uh there's a lot to get used to i mean like you know i mean that's why this stuff is hard to learn you know um so um anyway before we go do you, so anyway um close subspace and orthogonal projection you know uh tomato tomato right you know mm -hmm. so it's you know sometimes we'll think of events as being projections sometimes we'll think of them as closed subspaces um, and orthogonal projection it's orthogonal because it leans on these orthonormal basis that's why it's called that's right orthogonal. that's okay. right that's right and uh you know we tend to uh, it's it's with... orthogonal with regard to the complement so to speak that's what it's orthogonal to well orthogonal means okay so orthogonal projection that there's there's so many basis elements in and there's so many basis elements out and so yeah. and they're so, normal so so it'll be there'll be a complement and it'll be the space so, and the complement will be orthogonal so this is a this is the concrete uh coordinate version Mm -hmm. uh, talking about orthogonal projections, but maybe we ought to talk about uh, let's talk about the coordinate independent way of talking about orthogonal mm -hmm. projections. First of all, P is linear. Mm -hmm. Two, it's it's a linear operator. It's um, And it's a bounded linear operator. Um, uh, two, it is, uh, what is it? Oh, P squared is equal to P. And three, it's self-adjoint. What do we mean by the adjoint of an operator? A, X, comma, Y is the same as X, comma a y mm -hmm. so it's the it's the dual twin of the operator the adjoint so self-adjoint means that it's dual twin is equal to itself i.e um the conjugate transpose in a basis So represent it as a matrix and a basis with respect to an orthogonal basis when represented as a matrix in an orthogonal basis. Uh, P is equal to the conjugate transpose of P. Mm. 
a star is always the conjugate transpose. So this mm -hmm. is just talking about uh, self-adjoint or adjoint. And the whole conjugate is because this is a Hilbert space that's complex, where the complex numbers that's coming right. in? Yeah, yeah. This is a complex Hilbert space. Okay. And I think that, if I'm not mistaken, it was von Neumann that coined the term Hilbert space, and he might have done it in the book, The Mathematical Foundations of Quantum Theory. Mm -hmm. I think that he was, there wasn't a, um, you know, he was pulling together like different representations of quantum mechanics. And I think Schrodinger had already done that, but I think, you know, von Neumann saw the big, the larger picture and I think he called it a Hilbert space. Um, that might not be quite accurate, but it was around that time that, you know, the coin, you know, the term Hilbert space was coined. Um, so A is equal to the conjugate transpose of A. So if you want to think about adjoints um, very concretely, you can. Or if you want to think about them abstractly, you can. Uh, in, in operator theory, it's very important to be able to go back and forth. You know, the concrete, very important, abstract, very important. Anyway, that's a projection. Okay. So, and, and, you know, in a sense, these are going to be the outcomes of ex experiments. Um, the, uh, an experiment sort of is like performing a projection. It's sort of like you have this experimental apparatus that performs a projection on the state of the system and projects it into a new state. And if you project it again, you do the perform the same measurement, you end up in that very same state, unless the system is perturbed or mm -hmm. is otherwise allowed to evolve according to, according to, you know, a, a perturbation. So anyway, which which speaks to what we were talking about with regard yeah. to isolating a system like you know yeah yeah is so, it isolated or not you know there's a distinction so so this is the 1930s attempt to to formulate a um to formulate a metaphysics um that you know would explain quantum mechanics you know an overlay for quantum mechanics and it's still it's still kind of the standard way of thinking about things you know um so um, so let's just let's just talk for a moment like we might get excited by this definition because there, there's a certain thing that's happened you could form the event algebra So start with a collection of outcomes, which are subspaces, uh, E1, E2, and so forth, could be an infinite, and take all sums intersections to form the larger A larger collection of subspaces. And we'll call this the event algebra. <clears throat> and so it's the set of all H. Uh, 
And do we allow infinite? I don't know. I don't see why we wouldn't allow infinite sums. You know, you can take the sum of two subspaces, you get a subspace. So it's a set of all, say, f. Uh, that so f is uh, countable. Countable uh, sum uh, combination. Things sum slash intersection of the outcomes, basic events. E1, E2, and so forth. Okay, so it forms an event algebra. Mm -hmm. uh, so it turns out that this event algebra together with a sum and intersection is not in general a Boolean algebra. And why? Because the Morgan's law doesn't apply. In other words, uh, if you take two events, F1 plus F2, and intersect them with an event F3, that's not always equal to F1 intersect F3. Those subspaces, the intersection, plus F2 intersect F3. Are, are Bell's inequality related to this? No. That's something different. Okay. No, Bell's inequality is a real thing. This is sort of a pseudo-fiction. I'm going to argue that this is not really the grist of the difference between quantum mechanics and classical. And this is often, I, I don't know, I've seen this before, mm -hmm. saying, oh, this is the difference. You know, oh, we've identified the difference. It, no, this is not really the, the, this doesn't get at the heart of the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you why in a moment. But I want to get, I want to clear the air by talking about this for a moment. Okay. Now, I mean, you can think of easy examples, right? You can think of uh, like H being, say, R2, F1 is equal to, say, the subspace generated by the basis vector is 1, 0, F2 mm -hmm. is equal to the basis. So you take the basis vector 0, 1, and F3. Can you guess how to? what subspace you should take for F3 to make this not true? One over minus one? Or one, one, say, even so Okay. Left okay. side. The left side is equal, well, if you take F1 plus F2, that's the entire H, and so you're just gonna get F3. The right is just gonna be zero. It's gonna be the subspace generated by zero, effectively. <clears throat> well, let's see why F F one intersection F three. Oh, I see. There's Nothing. no. Uh... It's zero. Yeah, they only. <clears throat> oh, oh, I see. This it's an <clears throat> additional thing, right? I see. So well, and the funky thing here is the funky thing here is uh, what does addition mean, right? So it means addition of subspaces. That means this linear combination. Of okay, and these are linear, right? Like these are you're multiplying by scalar, so you have a they're one dimensional subspaces. Yeah, and I'm talking about over the well, the reals are complexes. So can we go back just a a, a bit uh, to 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 the definition of event, right? Like, yes, and just go back down. Okay, so you have these outcomes. So you define an event as uh, the set of F, where F is a countable combination of basic events, right? So that's yeah. the event algebra, I'm sorry. Yeah. So 
And an event is an outcome? Is that? An event is a, no, an event, an, an outcome is a basic event. So you choose some basic, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily want to choose all subspaces. Although you could choose all one-dimensional subspaces, you know, you know, basically the projective space, and then you get all subspaces for them if you want to. It turns mm -hmm. out that's really Byzantine. That's way too big for mo for pretty much all purposes of quantum. So how would you define an event? Like what's uh... we're gonna we're gonna get there. We're, we're gonna, gonna get there. Yeah, we're gonna okay. Get there. But I'm just okay. saying. I, I'm just saying. By itself, on on the surface, there's looks like there's some difference between this and classical, and classical. Mm -hmm. Uh, because you know we had De Morgan's laws that that applied, right. and, okay. and and we were all hot and bothered um, about De Morgan's laws not applying because they don't seem mm -hmm. to apply in the double slit experiment, um, mm -hmm. and and you know that showed that even a statistical mechanical ex um, uh, explanation of the double slit would not work because you had De Morgan's laws applying, and so and so. You know, you might think that you've got, you know, like with this simple setup here, just choosing subspaces, that you 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 really identified the difference between, you know, the fundamental difference between quantum and classical. And I say no, this is not. This is artificial. This, in practice, you have to your event your event algebras are much smaller than meets the eye, and so we're about to restrict ourselves. Okay, and I just note that uh, this example that you just showed uh, uh, shows the funky relationship between addition and intersection. That you know, yes. there. Well, that <laughs> that you get this type of thing that you were saying. So yes. continue. Somehow, somehow, addition is going to be considered, or an intersection is going to be considered, and mm -hmm. you know, Boolean algebra that's perfectly fine. In this algebra, there's something weird going on. Because okay. De Morgan's laws don't apply, and you know the other perspective here is that um, you might have an aha moment when you think about when you think about uh, projections. You know, like uh, you know, alternatively, the um, basic events are projected our projections I should say basic outcomes basic events or outcomes So a set of projections, um, and uh, so one so, event is a set of projections. Is that what you mean? No, each each so event is a, is a projection. You know, you can associate uh, if each outcome is a subspace. I can is a particularly chosen subspace. I can I can associate that subspace with its orthogonal projection or in one-to-one -one correspondence. And therefore I can think of outcomes as is uh, sets of projections. And note in general uh P E1, P E2 is not equal to P E two, P E one is they don't in general commute. And just to check, uh, so a projection is mapping from an event to an outcome. Is that right? No, a projection is just associated with an outcome. <clears throat> it is. It is. It is itself. You think of oh, the it's, it, uh, there, there's this um, bijection between projections. Yeah, yeah. You think of outcomes. you know there's one to one correspondence between orthogonal projections and the and the suspect. And so, what's the difference right. between? I mean, can we go back and define events, outcomes, and projections? Because I I have them all jumbled in my mind. Right. So let okay. So well, I'll give the example. Whatever, whatever helps. 
basic events. <clears throat> An outcome, a basic event, you're going to choose certain subspaces to be your basic events. Now, this is subspaces, this is projections. Mm -hmm. So, subspaces. And those are subspaces of the configuration space. Of H. Now, H in general is going to be the functions on configuration space if you're relating it oh, to like it's functions on configuration. Okay. Yeah, but but really um which ultimately could be like probability, like wave functions and things like yeah, that. Yeah, like or... three probability. Yeah, like the like two squares probability. But we're gonna get we're gonna get there. We're, get there. We're, mm -hmm. we're, we're gonna get there. We're not, you know, that's not really you're not starting not... from there. Okay, you're yeah. we're gonna so arrive at there. There's okay. projections. Okay, so so let's look at let's build this up again from events. Basic events, okay. We can think of them as subspaces or projections, tomato tomato, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Event algebra. Okay. Well, let's just talk about events. So subspaces, that means events are going to be um, like sums and intersections of E1, E2. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and outcomes are named, it's another name for basic events? Is that That's what right. outcome? That's okay. right. You know, outcome is just basic. Yeah. You know, so they're like, like the atomic. They're like the atomic event, so to yeah, speak. Yeah, yeah. And you know, in quantum mechanics, it's really, really important naming your atomic events. Now, in in classical mechanics, your atomic events are just single points. In, in, um, in configuration space, in in uh, in. Mm -hmm. And so this will be more sophisticated than so, just the... but but in terms of the the Hilbert space that results from that, these would just be your basic outcomes would essentially just be uh, projections onto you know functions that live on that point. In other words, Dirac delta functions at that at that point in configuration space, where more generally, you know, your your functions in Hilbert space can have a spread out mm -hmm. profile over configuration space. But in classical mechanics, they're just like very tightly, uh, very tightly concentrated bumps. Um, so that that I'm going to argue is the real difference here um, between classical and quantum. Anyway, we're going to get there. Um, events. So sums, uh, in intersections. Okay. So in 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 uh, so how do you sum and inter how do you sum up and intersect? Um, uh projectors so this would be uh sums which would be um you know p e1 plus e2 that'd be pro orthogonal projection so we're talking about like e1 plus e2 or e1 intersect e2 so that would be a sum of uh i mean that that's how you would write the projector of a sum of subspaces or you can write you know, projector of E1 intersect E2, which is really just the projection of E1 follow, I mean, times the projection onto E2. Okay. Um, now, wait a minute. Mm, I'm not sure I agree with this because these may not commute. Nope, I don't believe this. No, 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 no. Another we thing have to write up to that. Yeah. Maybe you'll speak to like I think in a Boolean algebra, I'm used to thinking that union is or rather than sum. Right? Yes. Um so and 
it is going to look I mean, I could imagine like if you have characteristic functions, right? Like if you have ones. Yeah, if you have non-overlapping characteristic functions, then it will be the. In addition would work, right? But usually you would use, you, I mean, that's just in my little mind. <laughs> yes. Um, and we're going to see that that is the case for projections that you just, you know, or uh, non-overlapping subspaces that are orthogonal is just you add up the projections. Mm -hmm. um, but in the case that there is some overlap, um, it's, um, well, no, we're going to see a much better fit or when we talk about event algebras that are orthogonal subspaces, I think that, you know, maybe, maybe it'll be clear at that point right now. It's just a, it's going to be a muddle because what I'm going to argue is that this is way too general for what we need. Anyway, um, so let, let's just get through this. So I, I think we have, yeah. we, I think we have to suffer through this in order in order to get to the clarity on the other side of it. Um, so events, and then these are uh, projections. Okay, so okay, these are events, and then event algebra. And and projections are mapping from the H to into h or where projections yeah they're linear they're linear mass from h into h yes okay so maybe i should have put that up here and so and so the point being that um and then they stabilize because they're projections so you know once you know the first project the first time you apply the projection it can do something but then afterwards it's not yeah. going to do you know anything different uh by what you said, right? The p squared equals p. Okay, so are we clear on what outcomes, events, and event algebra is? Yeah, that's very helpful. Okay, okay. so and you were talking about non-commutativity, I think, right? Or right, yeah. In note, yeah. In note, so you could talk about the event algebra here, um, although. Because of non commutativity, um, when you multiply projections, mm -hmm. non commutative projections, you don't get a projection anymore. So, so the event algebra, um, it's a little harder to explain over here in terms of projections because there's no clear way of combining projections if they're non-commutative to make another projection. Mm -hmm. so the best we can do is talk about combining the underlying subspaces and then and then formulating the projection on those, but we don't get any kind of nice uh, sum formula. So we or, don't even have an algebra of projections at not, this point. Not in the, not in the sense, not in the not in the sense of of multiplication of operators or or sum of operators. Or, or maybe to say because they are operators, you know, they follow rules of operators, but that the indices aren't necessarily going to be respected in any way. You know, like the, these. There may be no nice connection to what yeah. um, what's happening in the event algebra, right? I mean, you yeah. can apply one after the other. It's just yeah, doing its own thing. So let me let me uh, talk about these aha moments that sometimes you'll see in books. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. over here, you know, here's this other gotcha, you know, aha, different. Mm -hmm. And what I have to say about that is that that's sort of the misconception. That that's not really, you know, we don't really choose events arbitrarily in quantum mechanics. Um, anything that's going to make sense in terms of an event algebra is going to start with atomic events or outcomes that are 
orthogonal subspaces, not just regular old subspaces, but orthogonal subspaces. And when you choose orthogonal subspaces, then you get something that looks much more like a Boolean algebra. In fact, it is a Boolean algebra. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole thing is that, you know, um, there's a certain artificial aspect to that. It, this is the building blocks, but we are going to, we are going to restrict ourselves. What's artificial about this is that if you don't restrict yourself to your outcomes or your, your basic events being orthogonal subspaces, then first of all, it's not very useful. As far as I know, it's not useful at all. And the second of all, you get these false ahas that make you think that you're being different than, than classical mechanics, but it's actually misleading to think that way. And that's because of the way that the mathematical um, ideas are being laid out in starting so generally, Yes. when actually in the end, that's not what it's about. Yeah. So, okay. so, in, so let me just state this. So keep reality, continuing, right, like that. Uh... This is way too general. And just to promote my own ideas, uh, um, when I'm working with this combinatorial alternative to the wave function, like one of the things I'm saying is that, oh, maybe Schrodinger's equation needs an additional constraint, you know, where like the solutions should be orthogonal Schefter polynomials, you know, and, uh -huh. and working with that. So it's kind of like in that spirit, like, no, it's not so general. Maybe there's actually things are more specific than you could um, think if you just uh, were working with a particular math. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, we should talk about that a little bit more um, because I think you can, um, you know, there's these approximation theorems in mathematics where, you know, you can put together different widgets and approximate mm -hmm. anything you want from those widgets, like polynomials or, or you know, bump functions that you can move around and move the width. And you can control the width and the, and the, uh, and the height. Well, so as a functional and, analyst, analyst, you may be able to say, like, well, if you even if what I was saying was true, let's say, right? Like, but then what can you build from that or not, right? Like, you know, what would be the, yeah, so, are you going to recover so, everything or are you eliminating certain things? You know, can you rule things out? What's... Well, you see, I think any potential could probably be constructed from a, from a, from a, um, you know. Well, like a... thermite functions you're saying. For example, I mean, well, no, I'm saying like uh, think about moving a charge around so it's got a certain potential around it and then adding those up, you know, a bunch of charges in a certain configuration. I believe you could probably oh. approximate any any potential you want by just a configuration of charge. Um, you know, um, if you I've, can do one charge, if you can model one charge, you can model anything, basically. Yeah, you know, kind of. You know, there there is that aspect to approximation theory and functional analysis that as long mm -hmm. as you big enough vocabulary things that you can you can model anything. So that means that, you know, what does that mean in terms of the basic modeling functions like Shepard polynomials? It, I don't know, maybe what it means is that in the end, they're a complete orthonormal basis. In other words, you can model any function with them. Um, maybe that's maybe that's the expression of it. You know, well, and, 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 and that, to, to allow myself a little bit of tangent because I've been, um learning about Wigner's theorem, which relates to CPT symmetry, but also relates to the foundations of quantum physics that you're talking about. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and very much in this style, like you have Hilbert space, but you have these two levels. You have Hilbert space, kind of like you do, but then you focus on what they call ray space. So you're looking at, um, you're saying that things are equivalent up to a phase. So you'll get these subspaces that are ray spaces, and you're basically saying like those are your points, so to speak, or those are the things that are actually physically yeah. real, let's say. Right, right. These two levels. Yeah. But when you have those two levels, um, the beauty of it of Wigner's theorem is saying, okay, the thing that you're talking about on the physical level has lots of different ways you could talk about it on the ontological level. You know, it's like like the phenomenology of what you see, how things seem, that's all measurement, you know, is presenting that this is how things look in reality. Yeah. But there's an ontology saying, okay, but how are things are in whatever is math for nature, kind of like going back to this topic of like, well, how does nature do the math? 
So the point is that there's lots of ways that nature could be doing that math. There's lots of ways it could be setting up the ontology. And Wigner's theorem says that among those many, many ways are some very beautiful, simple ones to saying like, you know, it, you'll always be able to find, let's say, either an antilinear operator or a linear operator, let's say, if I've got it right. But basically, you know, and then the antilinear, like it'll either, the antilinear one will either square to plus one oh, or square to right. minus one. Right. Right. See, so what it's saying, it's basically saying like, yeah, there's this phenomenology of how things are going to look. And yeah, there's all these ways you could do the math. But if you're interested in beautiful, simple ways, there are beautiful, simple ways always that you can choose from. Yeah. And so in these notions of CPT symmetry, etc. So philosophically, it's very interesting uh, saying that there is a nice reality, you know, under certain definitions. So I don't know how that'll fit into your picture here, but I think these are yeah, kind of no, like- I mean, you'll see. So anyway, we're, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna write anything more, but what we're gonna say is that we're gonna restrict ourselves to a orthogonal set of, of basic mm -hmm. subspaces. And then we're gonna form the algebra from, the, from that. And then that looks like a Boolean algebra. <laughs> it turns out that that oh. is a Boolean algebra. Okay, and, so Boolean algebra it, is a nice ontology that we want, like, you know, there may be lots of physics that doesn't have the Boolean yeah. algebra, let's say, right? I mean, ways to formulating it, but there is a way that you can get what you want, which would be a Boolean algebra, like logic, basically, right? Like, uh, yeah. So I got that from Griffith's book, uh, Robert Griffith's book um, called Consistent Quantum Theory, and it, he just says that you know this is sort of the setup, and it's a Boolean algebra. It's like there there is no difference between that and mm -hmm. and the classical statistical mechanical way of thinking about about physics. Um, but what we're going to get from that is that um, uh, we're going to get from that uh, since basic events are projections um, that, you know, an observable or a measurable is going to be, you know, just associating numbers to projections and, uh, and that's going to lead to self-adjoint operators. We're also going to get the Born rule out of this whole thing. And we're also going to get something else, I forget. But we're going to get a few things out of it that, that are that are very fundamental to quantum mechanics from this formalism. And so this formalism is sort of an underlayment for the Born rule in, in the fact that, that self-adjoint operators are, are central in quantum mechanics, in, in a, particularly when you're talking about experimental outcomes you know the measurements experimental me <laughs> measurements that behind every experimental measurement is a self-adjoint operator that encodes the possible values that you can get from that measurement and that's why self-adjoint operators are linked with observables and it's the it's through this link of subspaces or where there are orthogonal projections that we're going to make that link so anyway, we're not that far from it, but you know we didn't get there this time. So next time. And so um, this also brings to mind like adjoint operators, self-adjoint operators that you really, uh, as a functional analyst, uh, uh, identify with. Uh, I'm very curious how that relates to adjunctions in category theory, where adjunctions are mathematical analogies. And mm -hmm. so adjunctions are basically saying like, you're looking forwards, you're looking backwards. So when you have those uh, angle brackets and you have the two operators, I think the idea is like one of them is kind of like looking forwards and the other one is inverting it, looking backwards. Um, and in terms of how they're functioning and somehow they're nicely relating or even are maybe even identical with each other. I'll ask about that. Um, yeah, there are, and, there, there are operator theorists who use category theory, you know, that, that uh, you know, that's a, that's part of the language of their, of their formalism. So, um, so I went doubt that there's something like that, but I don't know if it's a one-to-one -one match, I, you know, between adjunctions and adjoints. But anyway, we can look at that together. You know, I mean, you know mm -hmm. about category theory. I know about operator theory. Maybe we can put them together. But the thing is, I need a tutor another tutorial on category theory from you, and then and then maybe we can work together. So maybe that could be one fun project that we do. So for to kind of summarize for our listeners and just to say like um we're um 
John is going to Lithuania uh, for the first time in his life. Uh, he has roots in Lithuania, and I am in Lithuania. I have roots here too. So um, that'll be great fun. Um, uh, and then um, what have we done with John? This is a pedagogical experiment, you know, because we'll, you know, and it, teaching me, teaching others, you know, looking at these ideas, probably self-teaching John is, but certain uh, core ideas in the history of quantum physics, which uh, John is rethinking, um, as he mentioned, the adjoint operators, these ideas of measurement, uh, quantum probability theory, we're leading up to that. Uh, he compared it with uh, classical situation. Uh, and then he's laying down the mathematical uh, foundations for this, which in a certain sense are misleadingly general in the beginning, but then you add more and more layers and you get very specifically to the, the, the type of beautiful math that we want, which will be like a Boolean algebra, it will be probability theory, but then it'll be enriched, I guess, further. And so uh, when we're gonna be working together, uh, we're gonna be looking at connections between the math that's relevant for cognitive frameworks, like bot periodicity seems to be uh, applying complex linear structures and two by two matrices on symmetric spaces which seems to be kind of like how nature's working in quantum physics in the type of things, uh, and especially like in the uh, evolu extra dynamical evolutionary approach. Uh, this distinction between self and world, you know, is maybe very much distinction between like the classical and the, the quantum worlds. How are they related? We're going to be engaging on that. Um, uh, we'll have a meeting uh, of Math for Wisdom on the Thursday that you're here with me as we're getting ready to leave on that evening. We'll cook up with our 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 uh, PhDs our uh, our participants and so um just I want to then thank you uh uh John for teaching me for teaching us and I'll I'll conclude with a prayer uh to have you have a safe journey have us have a really fun time here inspiring uh working together like having our subconscious just engaged with the land of Lithuania that you've heard so much about but you can see the countryside you can see uh, the, the Jewish heritage uh, and, and Lithuanian heritage in the cities. Uh, your grandfather's brother is uh, Jacob Robinson. We'll be doing road trip to see his whole life uh, vista landscape. Just hoping that you can uh, absorb this and hoping that this kind of like uh, is exciting for our work together, that we have ideas that kind of really click. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to yeah but we have one more meeting before I come. Right, on Monday. And we're having one more uh, with you and I. And so I'll be publishing these, I think, uh, going over them. Okay. So peace right. and love. Okay, peace. So, thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video for subscribing to this YouTube channel and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I'm a Patreon supporter for Math for Wisdom because Andres and I have been friends for a long time, most of our lives. And the conversations I've had with him over the years have been very useful for me. Uh, he's also a big, big fan, my supporter, you know, of my work. And um, we just, we have deep conversations about math and physics that have been useful for charting the course of my interests. And, you know, I'm just, I'm grateful and, you know, I, I want to support that and, you know, our weekly or bi, you know, semi-weekly or bi-weekly conversations have been, have been um, very important for me in the last couple of years, especially. So, yeah, that's why I'm a supporter.